Well, welcome to another amazing podcast show today. My special guest and very good friend that I have today. In fact, as a matter of fact, we're in a mastermind group together. He's actually been in real estate now for almost two decades. Now, he started as a traditional real estate agent with Remax, where his team was recognized, can you believe this, by the Wall Street Journal as a top 100 team. In addition to that, my guest was the number one Remax agent in Iowa. By the time he was 29, my lands, give me a break. So he made the transition from realtor to actually a full-time real estate investor. Now, over the course of his career, he's been involved, listen to this, in over $300 million in real estate transactions. Now, while he was still the managing broker for the real estate agency in Des Moines, well, actually he still is. He still is right now. His primary focus is on real estate investments. His portfolio is just all over the place. It includes houses, it includes industrial properties, and his business does all types of real estate deals. Uh, he does wholesale deals, hotel deals, fix and flips. I mean, you name it. My guest, friends, is a true visionary dreamer and a problem solver. He's on a mission to make a deep, personal impact in the lives of his team members and his business partners. And with that, folks, I'm so excited to have on the show with me today. Welcome, my friend, Mr. Neil Timmons. Welcome, Neil. Jay, thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again, too, Neil. We were just uh, in person a couple of weeks ago at our uh, mastermind meeting. Yeah. And um, I'm so glad we got uh, introduced. And uh, my lens, we've just got a lot in common. So, Neil, first of all, before we really dive in, uh, just tell us, you know, how did you get into this business? Well, I got into a business. It was 2000 and. Um, uh, 2003, 2004, I was a banker working for Wells Fargo, a personal banker. It's my first job out of college. Uh, I got uh, second mortgages, checking accounts, savings accounts, that type of thing. And my mom and I were talking one day. She is, uh, I've got three brothers. So she raised all of us, stayed home, raised all of us. And we were talking and she's like, ah, you know, it's, all the kids are out of the house. It's time for me to go do something. What should I do? And I thought, you know what? You make a good realtor, mom. Um, uh, you, you seem to have a knack for houses, for style, for, for talking to people, for being connected. I said, you should, you should think about that. She thought about it and said, oh, you know what? I'm going to do it. So she went, did it uh, in her first year in there. She made twice what I made at Wells Fargo. And so her and I were talking one day and I said, ah, it's time for me to make a change. And so you know, about a week later, I knocked out the 40-hour class required to get one's licensed and there you have it. I, that was my first step right into traditional real estate as a real estate agent. I got you. Well, give us the secret. What in the world did you do to become like the number one agent in your area? What is it that, I mean, you had to be doing something different that took you to the number one spot. What is it or was it? Yeah, well, I, I think it always starts with a couple of things, where, you know, especially in that, that business, uh, a work ethic. You know, you've got to bring a work ethic in, in that industry. There's no way around it. And then the next one is marketing. How do you do, how are you uniquely different? I remember uh, my first managing broker drawing a, a circle and a, and a big piece of paper and he put a little dot in the middle and goes, there's 2000 agents and this is you in the middle. You have to figure out how you're different. What's your unique selling proposition? And so I, I I've been a big fan of masterminds and you and I connected one. I've been a big fan of one for, for them um, for years and years, because there's a lot of things people are doing successfully in other places that it just require, how does one educate themselves and then put that into place in your own backyard. And so I was the, I was the first agent in Des Moines, Iowa to be utilizing Google ads. No, this, this, this dates me, right? 2005, 2006. It just didn't transpire. People weren't using them. It was Google was trying to figure out their revenue stream. I think Google ads uh, just dominated. I mean, we just dominated in, in Google ads. So you were the first in your market to use Google right. ads. Right. 
Yeah. We were, you ready for this, Jay? We were getting leads. This is buyer or seller leads for $6 a pop. Good night. <laughs> My lands. Well, I can tell you what a Google yeah. ad lead cost me today. 85 bucks. 85 bucks. Mm -hmm. 85 bucks. And that's not a bad deal. I'm no. in a small market. Sure I mean, there's right. some big markets. I know we, sure. you and I got some friends that are paying $200, $300 yes. to get one Google ad lead. Indeed. Of course, the beautiful thing about Google ads is, you know, they're looking for us. Right. You know, they just didn't show up in the Facebook news feed, right? Yep. No, nope. they typed it in. They're looking for you. I love it. One of my favorite questions I love to ask my guest, Neil, I'm going to ask you. If you knew when you started in real estate investing, what you now know today, what would you do different? Uh, I would have done two things differently. I would have, well, the outcome would have been different, but I would have gotten into masterminds, to groups, to circling, to putting myself in uh, arenas of like-minded, similar goal people. And then I'd educate myself through that arena and I would have gone to commercial real estate investing earlier versus later. And why would you have gone into commercial earlier than later like you did? Yeah, the dollars. I mean, it, everything's bigger in my mind. It's not to say it's easier. It's just different. I, I say for the, for the juice, it's easier, meaning the squeeze is about the same and the juice is better. If would you say sense. your commercial uh, would you say your commercial projects are more about building long-term wealth than say comparing to a uh, fix and flipper house or are you flipping commercial projects? Uh, that's a good question. So they are primarily focused on long term and you know part of that is that one house can only get you so far. So for one for for it to equal you know one building in a portfolio I need 10 or 20 houses. And at some point the management is, is just so different between the two. And don't hear me, don't hear, hear me right. I do all of it. You know, I'm, we're in a, we're in a business from, from what I do, from what my team does is that we're, I call us a deal source. So we're trying to identify value, whether that be in single family home, duplexes, triplexes, fours, or eights, whatever it may be, or into the warehouses to, to office buildings, wherever the value is, we're trying to identify that and, and find ways to, to capture that and then put it into place, find, figure out the best exit strategy because every piece of property has a different best exit strategy. Yeah. What you just said reminds me of something my uh, father told me when I was 24 years old, he said, Jay, today you've got to work for your money. But as quickly as you can, put a plan in place to where your money is working for you and you have the choice as to whether you want to get up for that day job. So I know what you're talking about. Another one of my favorite questions, Neil, to ask my guests is, as you look back over your real estate investing career, what would you say was your hardest struggle that you had to deal with and what lesson or lessons did you take away from that? Uh, well, this is going to end in a plug here. So, so, so the, I mean, the biggest challenge I've ever had to go through is hiring people, is building the team and the structure around me, finding the right people, dealing with the wrong people, uh, dealing with, you know, terrible horror stories about hiring the wrong people. You know, the, the, the statistic is the average cost of hiring a wrong employee is about $15,000. And so it's significant. I can tell you I've hired worse people than $15,000 mistakes, way worse. And so, you know, the lesson there is, is if you're going to, what the old saying is, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So the intent is knowing that I've got a long life to live. I want to go far. And so you have to learn how to go together. And so that's really a lesson I took away. And that required putting some deep thought into our business. What, what, what do we stand for? What are our core values? What's our culture and being able to build that from the foundation up, which then eventually led us to the ability to, to attract the right people, put these operating procedures in place to attract more of the right people and leverage that. 
Well, you just mentioned the word culture uh, in your business. Uh, it's a two-part question. What do you mean by your culture? And after you define what culture means, what does your culture look like and how is it different from other businesses? Yeah. Culture in my mind is how we live our core values. So what, what do we stand for? What do we believe internally, intrinsically? What in that, that becomes the methodology in which we hire fire, which we, which we operate from. So that's uh, how it actually rolls out into practice and how we live that culture. And so how we live it for us is, you know, for procedurally, we have a, a huddle call every morning at 930. Every, the whole team's on it. We have KPIs. Everybody's got a number or everybody has numbers we're still reporting on. So for us, you know, part of our culture is that this is a, a business. Well, clearly it's a business, but we're in a results oriented business. That's the only business we're in. The results matter. There is no place to hide. And uh, so the, how does that play out? Everybody's got numbers. Everybody's reporting. Everybody knows how we're going, how the month's going. There is not a question in any given month of how we're doing. Everybody knows what the numbers are. Um, yeah. When you say K and not to interrupt you, but when you yeah. say KPI, let's make sure everybody understands yeah. what KPI stands for. Yeah. Key protective productivity indicator, key productivity indicator. So, so what are some, so what are some of your key uh, indicators? So on the, on, let's say on the acquisition side, we're measuring how many minutes are on the phone the previous day. How many minutes are on the phone? How many offers did they make? How many contracts are in negotiation at the current time? How many contracts did they ink? And where are they at month to date? Is everybody on the team hearing each other report? Yes. Do you believe that activity uh, of holding each other account? Well, I don't know if that's holding each other accountable or not. You're holding them accountable uh, by that, by having that huddle call. But um, do you think by having that daily call to where they're having to report their production and their uh, productivity. Do you think that gives them extra motivation to produce better? Uh, I think it, 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 yes. And I don't think it's necessarily a function of us, me holding somebody accountable or uh, uh, holding them accountable to the team. They're, one of our other core values is you're held accountable to yourself. Uh, Lou Holtz was once asked this, you know, somebody, a, a reporter observed, Everybody's really motivated in your team. How in the world do you get everybody so motivated day in and day out? He said, it's easy. I just eliminate the ones who aren't. And <laughs> same thing happens here is that if, you know, you know this, I mean, motivation washes off. It's like a shower, right? And so I don't, you know, motivation is great to an extent. I need people who are inspired, who are inspired by what it is and aspired by what it is that they're doing, that we're making a difference on a daily basis, that they're in the right spot. And as a result of that, the motivation, you know, my ability to have to come motivate every day or on a regular basis is just almost not necessary. Yeah. You know, you and I heard Frank McKinney speak mm -hmm. uh, yeah. at our last uh, mastermind and I love his definition. He differentiated the difference between motivation. And he said, just what you did motivation, yeah. you know, is like soap. It washes off, right. you know, in the shower. Right. Then he gave the distinction of inspiration. And then he gave the distinction of aspiration, which is, you know, all the way to the point of le leading, uh, leaving a legacy. Yeah. Now let's go back to your culture and matching up core values. Yeah. What, how, how in the world do you go through a hiring process of team members that most likely ensures or helps ensure that that person matches up to your culture, to your team's core values? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's several different methodologies, you know, one of them being you, you, uh, we value high intelligence. So that's one of our core values here. You and that, and that's largely because uh, I, in order for me to get engaged, we got to have real conversations and you got to be able to keep up. I want to be able to keep up with you. So we, we value intelligence. And so that has us testing people uh, as they come in. We're testing literally from an IQ standpoint and drawing it back. I know that seems a little weird, but let me, let me draw this back of all of the tests and methodologies, everything that's ever been studied relative to, somebody's ability to perform a job and to do it well, the number one key indicator is what's your IQ? How intelligent are they? 
because the smarter you are naturally, the faster you can pick anything up. And so we test for that. And then we have a standard in place that you, somebody's got to be able to, to be above a certain threshold in order to take the next steps in that process. You know, people smarts is, is a little harder one to, to test because it is a core value of ours. You've got to be people intelligent. And we're in the business where we're dealing with sellers direct or we're building relationships with brokers, whatever it may be. You've got to, you've got to be able to build some relationships with the folks. And so you got to be people oriented. And that is, that's tougher to measure. And we're doing that through a series of multiple interviews with multiple people on the team to see, can they do it? And everybody's got input on the team then when it comes to hiring. Do you believe in the philosophy of hire slow and fire fast? Uh, yes. And you'll see that play out in terms of what it is that we do now, because for us to hire, I mean, we're taking people through multiple sequences, um, tests and interviews, and then, and then cautiously bringing them on and then set an expectation to, to go, hey, this is, this is what it looks like. Yeah. What are your favorite ways these days to find candidates to hire for your team? Yeah. You know what? Let me, I'll mention the book that I wrote because I actually wrote a book specifically on the subject matter, unicorn hunting for real estate investment companies. So how to easily attract screen and land a unicorn. It's, it's a complete hiring funnel. Our, our best way is, you know, I would say, ha, let me, let me set this up first. Half our business is, is virtual. So a little more than half. Most of the team is not here in, in Des Moines. And so our best way is to go off and then you, we utilize ZipRecruiter. So we use ZipRecruiter, but it goes past that because let's, Jay, let's just run a little, let me ask you two questions. If you were to, if you were to look for a job today and you went to ZipRecruiter and you had to punch in a city in which you want to look for a job in, where would you look for that? What city would you punch in? I would punch in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. And, and that's because you either live there or want to move there. Is that fair to say? That's because I got a lot of family there. A lot of family there. Okay. Sounds perfect. So what, what we've noticed, and, and this has all been tested through our methodology of ruling this out, is that people, when they go in and they look for a job, it's generally speaking, they're, they're punching in a city that they either live in or they want to live in. Even if it's a remote role, which so many roles are remote today, right? And so our key has been to go in and not just post a job in my home city and put remote role. It is to go in and post the job in 100 cities or 150 cities. And we have the title of the job slash remote role. And what that does is literally, I mean, the last few jobs in which we posted, it is not uncommon that we're at two to three to 4,000 applicants in a three-day period. My lands. All right. I got to ask this, Neil. How, I know it's in your book. I know it's in yeah. your book. Yeah. And in fact, let's put that website up there one more time. I want everybody to hear this because it's a fantastic book. Go to www.land, as in land, L-A-N-D, A, the letter A, unicorn.com. Landaunicorn.com. Hey, Jay, right, let, so me, let, me, let me mention here before you go there, I, I want to do something special for your show. So on that website, you can get the book for free. Just pay the shipping and handling. Oh, I appreciate that, Neil. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Awesome. So you get three or 4,000 applicants right. in a very, very short period of time. All right. What in the world? I know it's in the book. Yeah. But we don't want we don't want to wait for the book. No, we want to order I'll give the book. It to you. Order the book. Yeah. What in the world is your first paring down process of the who in the world you're actually going to interview out of all those thousands of applicants? Yeah. The first step, that's the question, right? Yep. Yep. The first step is to take them into uh, the personality index. We want to know what their PI is, your personality. Now they're going to do that. They're going to do that automatically online, right? Yep. Right. Yep. And so we've got for every job, we have two to three personality index profiles, which are acceptable to us per role. And so what we do is we, we have a, the whole methodology is in there about how we communicate. They take that, they provide it back to us. And then, it's, you know, for us, it's a pass fail. If they fail, they're out. If they pass, we're on to the next step, which the next step then becomes another screening tool, which we're testing IQ along with a couple of other tests or a couple of other things. It's all one test, but it measures multiple things within that test. 
their, you know, one of them being their ability, you know, how excitable are they? So, you know, if you've, if you've got, right. I mean, depending what role somebody's in, if I've got a closer and, you know, I mean, you know how this goes. I mean, things melt down all the time in the closing world. Who's very excitable. It's not a good personality fit for a closer. I need a steady hand in a closer role because every well, things are just going to go wrong. That's how it's going to go. You know what? What I find interesting uh, over the years, the uh, the glad handler, the um, the one that's just like you know running around yelling all the time, yeah. as opposed to the very quiet, very organized, listens much more than they talk, yeah. outcloses those other people all the time. You're exactly right. Yeah, which you know by, you know maybe some people wouldn't think that. They say, hey, no, I close somebody, right. I got to get them excited, right? right. I got to get yeah. them excited. But I'm thinking of one particular closer that he's like the, he's like the, he's the quietest person on the planet. Sure. And he stays on the phone with them or he sits down with them at the table until they either say, leave me alone or they buy. He just keeps asking very soft probing yeah. questions yeah. until they buy. That's it. Just you've got two ears, one mouth. You need to use them in that proportion. Right. And then the ability to listen and then ask strategic soft questions lands. All right. So Neil, I do not know the answer to this question. Right. In fact, I haven't known any of the answers to any of the questions sure. that I've asked you so far, but I just want to let the audience know this is not a setup. I do not know the answer to this question. So I'm going to risk asking it. You okay. ready? Bring it. All right. So I order your book. I get the book. I understand the book. This is how I should hire people. But I don't want to do all that stuff. Yeah. Have you got like some kind of service that can like help me hire people? Yeah. That it's, it's a good like, question. Like, I can like just like put them in my seats. Yeah. Yeah. No is the answer. I know you were hoping for a yes, but no is the answer. But what I do have um, as part of the book, when you order it, you, you do have an option of buying all of our video train series, which my COO, Ava, who you met a couple weeks back, um, she put together all of our, every portion, every section of the book broken down to video sequences. So you can hand 80 or 90% of this off to somebody else in your office or a VA can do literally most of this. My involvement in this is in the hiring process today is minuscule because we didn't get able to package it up and then outsource it to various folks through tremendous standard operating procedures. Well, that's what all of us entrepreneurs and sure. business owners want. We want to be able to hand this to a VA and say, right. okay, go implement this and get Correct. me somebody good. In fact, I just did that last week. I've got a uh, my uh, my lead manager oh, yeah. that make that makes sure none of my seller leads fall through the crack using our CRM and all that kind of right. stuff. I've been involved in interviewing everybody that's ever been on our team until last week. I said, Trixie, you've been my lead manager for three years. You know who can do what. And then I've got a new guy on the team that's a fantastic outbound caller. He's in charge of training. I said, you ain't going to hire somebody that you that you don't think you can train to do the job. That's right. I said, you don't need my approval. Hire who you want. Right. Right. <laughs> and let them do it. Okay. Now, now, Neil, I want to dig a little deeper now into you. Yeah. I want to, I want to dig into, into Neil Timmons. Yeah. All right. Like what's in between your ears that's going so, on. Sounds so good. I want you to share with me and the audience, just one personal habit you got going on that you can't live without. Oh, you're going to like this based on what we talked about before I came on uh, working out. That is the one personal habit that I, uh, it, it, it was about two years ago. I got to a point where I was just going, you know what? I'm, I'm just, I don't have the stamina. I, I just don't feel as good. Don't feel as healthy. I, something's got to change. And this is coming from a guy, you know, I, I was, I, I was an all state offensive tackle. I played football at the university of Nebraska at Omaha. And so, I, and then I didn't work out for years or not, not heavy with weights. I would, I would do some, some walking, 
just try to maintain my weight. But I got to a point where I was going, I need to get stronger and just get a little more focused. And that's the one thing I can't live without. The, the side benefit, and perhaps even, perhaps the bigger benefit has been, it keeps me, gets me up earlier. That's because now I make a commitment to put in, it's, it's habitual in terms of how it, it works into my day. So doing it at the front end of my day works best. I get to work a little earlier and I am, I'm sharper. It's just, I can go and end up with more energy through the day. So it's transcended into my business and improved what's going on here. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I got a Stairmaster uh, in mine and Carol Joy's home. I get on the Stairmaster for 22 minutes, 22 minutes. And I'm telling you, I know it's good for my body, but quite frankly, Neil, I don't do it for my body. Right. I do it for my brain, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. When I'm doing my Stairmaster, I, I, I'm convinced I could be wrong, but I'm convinced nobody can outthink me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's that's terrific. You know, one other thing, you know, we talked about um, leadership and the ability to leave a legacy. My son uh, turned 16 uh, just, just a couple months back. And so now, you know, he's free to roam about the world in, his, in the car. So he's, he's 16. And what what he decided to do as soon as he turned 16 was going, Dad, can I come to work out with you every day before before I go to school? So now I'm now things got moved up even sooner because he, school starts promptly. Can't be late to that one. I can be a minute or two behind at the office. And so uh, he's now I mean, every day you know, he's he's there. He's pushing me to go, all right, let's, let's roll. Let's do one more set, dad. That's awesome. That's yeah. a, well, yeah. Hey, look, you, you got, you got time. You're hanging out with your son. Yeah. yeah. It's true. What advice would you give to folks that have not done their first deal yet? Oh, have not done their first deal yet. Um, just take action. You know, there's, there's so much information on, you know, that you provide that gets provided in, in YouTube university. Uh, and the information can be really good. At the same time, you can drown yourself in it. So at some point, you just got to get literally, a, you know, a quick little three-step formula. You know, how am I going to find the one deal? What am I going to? What is the paperwork I have to put in place to lock the deal up? And then literally just get going, get moving, yeah. start taking action. Yeah. Neil, I ask you the question for newbies. Uh, if you don't mind me sharing, if you don't mind me answering the same question for myself. It. The best advice I can give somebody that's either brand new or they're a seasoned real estate investor, I teach and I practice, get the money first. Get the money lined up first. Neil, I know you know people like I do that say, oh, go get the deal under contract. Go get the deal under contract. The money will show up. And I go like, where? Is where? It, I mean, is the money just going to like, you know, rain out of clouds? And so my advice for folks, Neil, uh, to go along with yours is get the money lined up first. That's why I'm known as the private money authority. Neil, I just finished writing my brand new money guide. And my money guide is called seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate business and help you build incredible wealth. And folks, I want you to have this for absolutely free to get your, your business just launched and get you on the fast track to private money. Folks, you can get this money guide for free at www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide. jconner.com forward slash money guide. It'll get you on the fast track to private money. Uh, Neil, what you got exciting coming around the corner that you're working on or coming around on the horizon? Well, we're working on additional commercial transactions. Um, I, I also host a podcast called Real Grit. And so uh, we can get you on there, Jay, because I would love to have you as a guest. We can turn the tables. I can ask you some questions. Uh, it, it, that's really the, the bulk of it is uh, focused on additional commercial transactions. And that, that means I couldn't agree with what you just said more. So how that relates to me is we connect with folks and obviously raise dollars and cents to put, put commercial transactions together when we've got, uh, when we've got something in place and you're right. Uh, there's, there'd be nothing worse to be in and all of a sudden land a, a deal of a lifetime. And then you have, you, you don't have money lined up. I mean, it, it just, it just goes away. 
Right. Yeah. And I mean, this world of private money, we're not talking right. banks. We're not talking right. institutions. We're not talking hard money lenders. We're talking actually doing business with, uh, with individuals. Well, Neil, you get to give the parting comments. How would you like to wrap us up here on the show? Final, oh, thoughts. Uh, final, final thoughts. Uh, I, I'm just appreciative for what you're doing. You know, for me, it is about creating this business is a, is a conduit of our ability to earn dollars and cents so we can figure out what our, what our big why is. And for me, that's really the ability to get back, to help people through this industry. This industry has blessed me in a very big way. Um, all the masterminds, all the relationships that I've been able to build over the years has been, have been very, very good to me. And so uh, that's why I started, you know, my, my business is legacy impact partners or legacy impact investors. Um, our ability to to go and, and help people, other investors as well. So people who need to dollar and cents, who are looking at doing commercial transactions or, or fix and flip, we help and connect with folks that way. Um, so I, I really appreciate having me on and, and for what you it is that you do and how you make such a deep impact in, in people's lives in this business, Jay. Neil, thank you so much for joining me. Well, there you have it, folks. Another episode of this podcast. I'm so excited you joined us. And look, we really, really appreciate five-star reviews and leaving us uh, comments. So uh, on iTunes, if you're listening to us on iTunes, be sure to uh, leave us those five stars and some comments. Be sure to like, share, subscribe. If you happen to be watching us on uh, YouTube, be sure and tap that little bell so you don't miss out on any other future exciting and amazing episodes that we have. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business to the next level, and we'll see you right here on the next podcast. Mm -hmm. All right. Great Thank job. Out there, Neil, just by the way, Neil, we are still live on YouTube and Facebook. So this is what you call raw and real. Raw, raw and real. real. So uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to stay on for a minute. I'm now going to do uh, a, an amazing, enthusiastic introduction about you and what you're going to be uh, talking about on the show that we just did. Scott, any comments before nope. we do that? Good job, and uh, let's let's get this done. Jay, I think you sold me a stairmaster. You, uh, I, I don't know anyone your age who has the level of energy in which you possess, and <laughs> I am jealous. I am I'm jealous of it. I mean it. Well, let me let me tell you, uh, the stairmaster I have. It's actually a stairmaster. I yeah. mean, it is a brand stairmaster yeah. with the original chains and the original computer readout yeah. on the thing. And it was my first purchase on the internet was it really? in 2000. What year was 9-11? 2001. One, yeah. 2001. And guess what? I bought it reconditioned from a, <laughs> from a retired Marine Corps um, veteran that went around to the different yeah. Marine Corps stations and would buy their used exercise equipment. Yeah. He would refurbish it. Yeah. Price it. I bought it on eBay. eBay. I was going to say, had to be eBay. Yeah. And he shipped it to me. And I've had no maintenance on it since 2001. And it still, wow. sweat, it still sweats me to death five days a week. Awesome. <laughs> you got your money's worth. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, uh, Scott, you may do a little three, two, one and do the intro. Yes. And, All right, uh, here we you go. and I'll go into the green room. All right. Excellent. All right, so here is the intro. And for all, for all of y'all watching Raw and Real right here on live, I mean, you're actually getting able to look behind the curtain as to what we actually do here to create the uh, audio podcast for iTunes and our other platforms. So here is the amazing introduction for my guest, Neil Timmons, that, is, that was just on and is getting ready to come on in the audio. And that's going to happen right now in three, two, one. 
All my lands folks, here we are on another episode, another podcast, and you don't want to go anywhere on this show because my guest that I'm getting ready to bring on, first of all, he is the number one and has been for years, the number one realtor in his market, and he's going to pull the curtain back and reveal what it is, the two things, the simple two things that he does and he did to maintain the number one realtor status. In addition to that, he's a full-time real estate investor. And the other thing that he's going to pull back and reveal to us here in this show is how it is, what is his process that he goes through to find, locate, and hire the absolute best people to be on the team. These people stay with him forever. And thirdly, he's going to teach us the culture the core values of his business, and they are going to be the kind of core values that you're going to want to have an amazing, long-lasting, and very profitable business. Here we go, folks. Right now, the next podcast, this podcast is here for you. There you go. If that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. <laughs> Totally. So we want them, we want them to stay on to the end anyway. Neil, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Tell your wife hi. Thank you, Scott. Thanks.